This is a revision video on the 2013 case study for Unit 3 Economics OCR GCSE. I'm basically going to go through all the sources and make a few points about them, but there's not really much to say on this first source because it's me meant to be an introduction. It all seems like a load of rubbish to me, but it tells you that there was a recession in 2008 and the sources are going to be on globalisation and the rest of it you don't really need to know about. This is figure one which is basically got information about the different BRIC countries in a table. All of these countries, if you look at them, have got a large land area which provides natural resources of production and increases the space for factories, more factories, more output. All of these countries also have a large population which increases the labour for use in production and increases the chance of innovation. Both of these lead to increased productivity and that leads to lower prices and more competitive countries. There's not really that much to say on Brazil, but if we move on to Russia, it has the largest land area and therefore lots of natural resources which can be used in exports. And if you go down to its exports, you can look at them and see that it uses these natural resources and exports. Unfortunately for Russia, a lot of these resources and exports are finite and non-renewable resources. So in the future, unless they can innovate and come up with new products, there will be a potential decrease in Russia's exports because they're going to run out of the stuff that they've been using. India has got a main export of call centres. Call centres often only provide low-wage jobs, which means that a lot of India won't benefit from its growth because they won't be able to afford the stuff that India is importing. Then if we move on to China, China's main export is manufactured goods, and these exports are going to have to change in the near future because otherwise China is going to lose production to other countries that are going to be able to produce at an even lower price. So China has to innovate. Figure 2 tells you the wages of lots of different countries. If you look at India, India's got an extremely low average income, which means that a lot of people are in absolute and relative poverty, which affects their health and this productivity, because unhealthy people are not as strong, and therefore they can't produce as fast, so India could face a loss of output if people are being less productive. India's got a low wage rate, which attracts companies to outsource here. So that's really good for India because it provides employment. But then on the other hand, the potential profits aren't actually injected into the Indian economy because the big MNC that's located here will take the main profits. India and China both have low wages, which reduce the cost of production, which increases the potential profit and makes your exports more competitive. The UK has got a much higher income than the British countries, and there's two problems with this. One, it costs a lot more to produce stuff, so production costs are higher, so these costs are passed on to the consumer, making our exports less competitive. And also, we've got an increased disposable income spend on imports, so we're going to buy more imports and our exports are less competitive. Obviously not ideal. Figure 3 has got quite a bit of information about multinational companies. And if you've forgotten what they are, multinational companies are companies with headquarters in one country that have got factories in lots of different countries worldwide. It's got a picture of shoes here because a lot of multinational companies like Nike or Nike or however you want to pronounce it produce shoes because they're easy to make with materials costing very little. It's very advantageous for MNCs to outsource to countries with no minimum wage because this means that the shoes cost almost nothing to make and they have massive profits. Most major multinational companies are either American, Japanese or Western European. So these countries will get the main profits, with countries like China, India and Brazil getting less profit because obviously the MNC is taking the most profit. So obviously that's not so good for China and India and Brazilian economies. But on the other hand, the MNCs often train their workers to increase their productivity and the workers will retain these skills for, in the future like for their own country's firms. So even when the MNC is left, these workers will still be more productive, so when their own country decides to make firms, they'll be able to produce more and therefore make greater profits. And China, India and Brazil also benefit from new technology and capital and increase in employment and potentially increase in economic growth when these firms come over here. Or well, over there, I don't live in any of them. MNCs put their factories in countries with developing economies because they can benefit from cheaper labour costs and raw materials which lower overall production costs which makes their products cheaper and obviously increases their profits. Figure 4 shows the shares of world output from 1990 to 2016. Developed countries have seen a massive decrease in the proportion of world output produced in the developed countries and this could lead to unemployment because if we're reducing our output. We're not, we aren't actually reducing our output, we're reducing the proportion of output that we're putting out. It means that the underdeveloped, or whatever you want to call them, less developed countries, are producing more and 
probably a greater variety as well, so it means we'll be importing more from them, so we'll be spending quite a bit. China's had a much greater increase in its share output than India because it's better at attracting FDI. This is because it's got more attractive locations and possibly lower wage workers or more trained workers. I guess the wages are sort of similar in both countries. I think India's actually lower, but it's got more healthy workers and that'll increase the productivity of them, so MNCs and other firms will find it more attractive to invest in countries that have got better quality workforce, essentially. Indian increase in output has been a bit slower because many Indian citizens are uneducated, which prevents them from contributing to growth in output because they've got a lower productivity or they're ill or stuff like that, which obviously prevents them from helping to contribute so the output isn't as great as it could be if they were healthier. But it still had a gradual increase in output. On to figure 7, which shows the annual increase in the value of goods and services traded globally from 2008 to 2011. You've got to be careful here, because it might look like there was a decrease from 2008 to 2009. And there wasn't a decrease in the value of goods and services, there was an increase, it was just a smaller increase than the year before. There's a nice big chunk of text at the top there, and it's to do with why there was such a massive decrease in the increase. It's quite hard to follow these increases and decreases, but sorry. Uh, because global interdependence occurs when there's world trade, because all the countries are relying on each other for different goods and services because they've all specialised in stuff, it means that if there's a decrease in demand in one country, so say the UK stopped demanding peanuts from India, a lot of peanut workers will go out of work in India or wherever I said we got the peanuts from, and they won't have as much money, they'll have a lower disposable income, so they won't be demanding maybe satsumas from China. And so China will obviously lose jobs. There'll be a worldwide negative multiplier effect. So that's why there'll be such a massive decrease. The increase in international trade, obviously there's been an increase each year, leads to a wider variety of goods and services available at a lower price because there's increased competition in economies of scale. So that's really good for the consumer. But then on the other hand, for the world population, the increase in international trade leads to many negative externalities such as pollution from either dirty industries if pollution if companies are trying to produce cheaper or transportation and air miles and stuff so that's not very nice bad for the environment figure six is all about brazil and the banana wars which is basically protectionism in action and protectionism is when an action is taken to try to reduce international trade for example with a tariff which is in this case which is a tax basically or you could have quotas and regulations and embargoes and stuff like that. But in this case, we're doing tariff, which is when a tax is added to the goods, which basically makes them more expensive. If you look at the demand and supply graph thingy, you can see that the price increase due to the tariff from P to P1 has decreased demand from Q to Q1. And decreased demand means less need for supply, so supply has reduced from Q to Q1 with a contraction of the demand and supply curve well, contraction of the demand curve. So basically, supply has decreased due to this tax. And basically, when it says at the bottom, the EU's had to reduce the tariff on bananas from countries like Brazil. This has led to a reduction in the price of Brazilian bananas, makes them more competitive, increases the demand for Brazilian bananas, probably decreases the demand for EU bananas, which means that EU banana producers are going to go out of business, job losses, and negative multiplier effect, and terrible stuff like that. Figure 7 shows the real economic growth rates from 2001 to 2011, and when it says real, it means it's taken inflation into account. I find it quite complicated with all these dotted lines everywhere all looking the same, so if you've got your own copy, I'd just colour them in. Obviously, you can't take your own copy into the exam, but if you're annotating it or looking at it, just colour them in different colours and make it all pretty, and it'll be much easier to see. If you look at all the different lines, you can see that China and India have had the fastest increase in real economic growth. And this could be due to their rapidly increasing population because it means they've got a greater workforce, so the country can produce more, and if it's producing more, greater output. Then if you look at 2007, you can see that everyone suffered a decrease in percentile growth. So obviously some people still grew, they just didn't grow as much. And some countries in 2009 actually went down, they had negative economic growth, and those countries were Brazil, the UK, and Russia. And that was the only year, 2009, that saw negative economic growth. 
If you look at all the countries and how they recovered, Russia actually recovered really fast from the recession with a rapid economic growth. And this could be because it's got a great land area and valuable natural resources, which is, it just got back to producing and it could just keep selling them. The UK has actually maintained relatively steady growth, except for its little dip in 2009. Aside from that, it stayed pretty steady, though after the dip it did fall a bit, which is a bit sad and depressing, but we'll have to survive. Figure 8 is called Where Does Growth Come From? So it's basically all about investment. China invests heavily in capital investment, which is spending on capital goods like machinery and equipment, which increases the capacity of China to produce goods and services in the future. So it means in the future it can have a much greater output than countries like the UK, which hardly invested at all. Only 14% of its GDP was investment. And that's really sad because it means in the future they'll be able to produce loads and so will India because they've got quite high as well and we'll be there not being able to produce very much at all. If we go down to the third tick, I don't know why they've used ticks. Ticks really annoy me when people just try to be funny with different bullet points. Just use a dash or a dot and that's it. Okay, <laughs> rant over. FDI is investment in productive assets by a company from another country. And China and India have got quite a lot of that. It doesn't say this here, but the UK has actually got one of the highest rates of FDI in the EU. So, come on UK. And India's growth is more domestic, whilst China's is export-led. And basically, domestic consumption means that products are bought and used in the country that makes them, rather than exporting them. So it's probably more advantageous to export your products to get money into the country. But it's still quite good to have growth within the country due to a positive multiplier effect. Figure 9 basically shows the imports and exports from the UK to the BRIC economies. Someone was obviously very bored when making this because they tried to make it all look indie with all the arrows and circle sizes. It does look quite cool but you know, it makes it, I don't know, I find it distracting. If we look at China we can see that we import over four times as much as we export from China so we have a great outflow of money to China which is really bad. If you look at the total imports and exports, I've done the sum and I hope it's correct, that we've got balance payments deficit of £20,944 million, where the BRIC economy, is, which is seriously bad, uh, means we're importing almost three times as much as we export. And this could be due to a variety of factors, and I've put two of them here. So it could be that production is cheaper abroad due to lower labour costs, because the UK can't compete with that because we've got our minimum wage. And this means our imports are more expensive than imports from BRIC countries, and so there's lower demand for them. Um, it could be that the growth in the real UK incomes, if you look at figure 2, I think it was figure 2 that had all the incomes on, you can see that UK's citizens have got a much higher uh, labour well, wage. So it means that we've got more money, higher disposable income, so we want to import more than the rich economies with their lower wages who can't afford to import stuff. Figure 10 is to do with the UK and where we should export to. And whoever wrote this article, the CBI, they've said that we should change our exports from going to the USA and Western Europe to going to the BRIC economies because they're growing economically, so there's more employment and that leads to a greater aggregate demand for imports. So if we send up, if we export to over there, we might find a really good market for our exports because there's so many people there and a higher aggregate demand. And if you compare that to the USA and Western Europe, it isn't growing quite as fast, so it could be really beneficial. If you look at the last sentence, it says that one of the UK's biggest export markets is the USA, which accounts for 17% of overseas sales. So that's actually quite risky for us, because say the USA had a massive problem, an economic crisis, then they we'd just lose everything, because we'd lose almost 20% of all of our exports, and we're just relying too much on them to buy our exports, so we need to spread the risk a bit better. Moving on now to figure 11, which is to do with deaths due to urbanisation and urban air pollution. Industrialisation is when an increasing proportion of the population is working in the manufacturing sector. And if more people are working in the manufacturing sector, there's probably more production going on, so probably more pollution. And if you look at here, you can see that China has got projected number of 590000, so 590,000 deaths per year. That's predicted um, from 2001 to 2020, which is really bad, obviously. 
And this could be because China uses cheap coal, which releases harmful fumes that, when burnt, produce electricity in an attempt to keep costs down. And because, obviously, I mean, there's a few deaths, quite a few deaths, a lot of deaths, but other countries might think, oh, China's doing really well growing economically. Maybe we should use their cheap fuels as, like, as well. And then there'll be lots of burning of cheap coal, which will be really bad because there'll be lots of harmful fumes and lots of people will die. If you look at the bottom, I think it says total there, or world, there's going to be 1,820,000 deaths per year, supposedly, if their prediction's correct, um, which is massive, and it shows that international trade has got many serious negative externalities, so rather than just focusing on the benefits, we do need to look at all the serious impacts that international trade is having worldwide. And we're on now to the final source, which is figure 12, which is about BRIC countries and the UK, basically all the different economic stuff, so inflation, unemployment and interest rates. We're going to go to inflation first and we can look and see China had deflation in 2009, which could be due to a fall in demand for its goods, because I know in 2009, if you look at that graph, figure 7, there was a big economic crisis everywhere. So there was a decrease in demand because all the countries having negative economic growth, they're trying to protect their own industries, they don't want to import loads of stuff, so that could be why China had a in fall in inflation because it had to reduce its prices dramatically to try to increase the demand for its goods. The UK has had quite a steady inflation. I mean, it's quite good, 3.6, I think, if I'm reading correctly. I can't see very well. 2.1, 3.3, 4.2, which is OK, but it's still below its 2% target. It's not in here, but I think we're doing really well at the moment with our inflation, so that's really good. But we're getting closer and closer to the target. And if you look at Russia, we can see that Russia's had massively high inflation. And that could be why it's got high interest rates, if we go on to interest rates in a sec, to reduce demand and decrease inflation. So we've talked about Russia's interest rates. If we look at the UK, the UK's got a very low interest rate, possibly chosen to weaken the exchange rate or to increase demand, which leads to a positive multiplier effect, if you remember the interest rate and monetary policy from Unit 2. Moving on to unemployment, India's actually got a really high unemployment rate, means that a lot of people in India don't actually contribute to economic growth. And if India could increase its employment rate, it would mean that more people would be contributing to the growth and it would grow faster and better. If we look at China, China's actually had a really steady low employment rate, which is really impressive, and it means that they've got lots of people in China contributing towards economic growth, hence why it's grown so fast. And that brings us to the end of the case study. Woo! Obviously, you can't get textbooks and stuff on case studies. So I've had to sort of look at it myself and try to work it out. But obviously, you might disagree and think that these figures mean something else. So if you do think that, just say, because I want to know. <laughs>